before I was going to take biology in high school, I thought most of biology would be about animals, or at least a pretty big portion of it. Imagine my surprise when biology turned out to be a lot more than animals, and we actually didn't get to animals until close to the end of the year. I found that to be pretty typical. In fact, even continuing into college when I majored in biology, I really didn't have much exposure to learning about animals specifically. Although, to be fair, there are just so many courses to select from after you finish general bio courses, and I'm naturally drawn to cells, so... Those always took over my scheduling. Grad school, yes, I had a class on animals. It was a zoology course, and it was amazing. I find that most people start out pretty fascinated with animals from a young age, and that really never goes away. I'm grateful for all the content I've learned in biology. Cells, cell division, cell processes, genetics, mutations, evolution, ecology, all of that, because it gives me a greater understanding of animals, which is the focus of this video. What is an animal? Seems simple enough, you might think of this or this, but you might not think about this animal here, an ant, or this sponge. But they're both animals. Generally, animals have some shared characteristics. They're multicellular and made of eukaryotic cells. They have specialized cells that do certain functions, and most animals, but not all, have them arranged in specialized tissues. Animals are heterotrophs, which means they don't make their own food like autotrophs. Instead, they must consume it. And unlike fungi, which are also heterotrophs, by the way, animals generally ingest organic matter in some form, whereas fungi externally digest and absorb their food. Most animals are motile, meaning they can move, at least at some point during their life cycle. So how do these animals fit in? We'll explore some major characteristics of nine different animal phyla. If we're going to do that, let's talk about some vocab that will involve animal characteristics. Symmetry, when talking about animal structure. If the symmetry is like slices of a pie, or to say it fancier, if you can have more than two planes dividing similar portions, well, that's radial symmetry. Some animals have that. It can be useful if you're sessile, meaning you don't move, because you can respond to your environment from many directions. Or bilateral symmetry, that means if there was a line going down the middle, the right and left halves would be very similar. Humans, for example, are animals of bilateral symmetry. Some advantages with this, well, moving forward is easier than it is for an animal that has radial symmetry. Okay, focusing on animals with bilateral symmetry, cephalization, it means the nervous system tissue is concentrated in a head region. Some advantages here because the mouth and then a lot of the sensing organs can be all there together in the head region, which is useful. And this is not an animal development video, so it's hard to talk about these words without going into the fascinating study of animal development, but we'll do our best. Animals that are considered triploblastic, which we'll get to in just a minute, are often characterized as protostomes or deuterostomes. There are multiple characteristics in development that each of these have. See our further reading. We're just focusing on one characteristic that is often discussed, but please know that exceptions exist. Protostomes generally have their first embryonic opening, called a blastopore, that develops into the mouth. Then a second embryonic opening forms the anus. But if the second embryonic opening instead becomes the mouth, and the first opening, that blastopore, becomes the anus, generally this is for deuterostomes. So using this general definition, if the first opening, blastopore, develops into a mouth, protostome. If the first opening, blastopore, develops into the anus, deuterostome. I'm really into alphabetical mnemonics, so M for mouth and P for protostome are close together, and A and D are close together. So we mentioned that protostomes and deuterostomes are triploblastic animals, and said that we'd get to that. What does triploblastic mean? Triploblastic animals have three germ layers. Germ layers are layers that eventually develop into different structures of the animal. There's an outside germ layer called the ectoderm, an inner germ layer called the endoderm, and a mesoderm, the middle germ layer. Some animals don't have that mesoderm layer and are considered diploblastic. They're neither protostomes nor deuterostomes. Many, but not all, triploblastic animals can have something called a coelom. A true coelom is a body cavity derived from the mesoderm that tends to be filled with fluid and acts as designated space for the animal's organs. It can provide shock absorption, cushioning, and space for organ development. We can classify animals depending on whether or not they have a true coelom. And for each phylum, we'll mention whether the animals in it have a coelom or not. So now, finishing some important vocab that's used in classifying animals, let's get started into a tour of nine major animal phyla. Please remember our tour is general, and exceptions can and do exist. Phylum periphera, the sponges. They're aquatic. Most are saltwater, and adults are generally sessile, which means they don't move. They have a porous body. 
they're sponges after all, and oxygen and food in the water passes through these pores. They have special cells that do intracellular digestion. That means digestion inside the cells. They don't have a gut, so no gut opening. They don't have organs, nor do they have true tissue. Most sponges do not have symmetry, although some exceptions can have radial symmetry. No cephalization and no coelom. Phylum Cnidaria. That includes jellies, sea anemones, and hydras. They're aquatic and can be saltwater or freshwater. They do have one gut opening acting as both the mouth and an anus, and they have intracellular digestion with certain specialized cells, but they can also have extracellular digestion, that is, outside of their cells, in a gastrovascular cavity. Cnidarians can generally have two forms, a polyp and a medusa. They can have specialized cells with fascinating organelles that can be used in stinging their prey. Most cnidarians have radial symmetry. They have no cephalization and no coelom. Phylum platyhelminthes. I like to think plat rhymes with flat. These are the flatworms. Many are aquatic, freshwater or saltwater. Some are terrestrial. Planarians and tapeworms are in this phylum. There are quite a few that are parasitic in this phylum. Most in this phylum have one gut opening. This phylum has bilateral symmetry, and they do have cephalization, but no coelom. It is now where we can add the descriptor of whether animals in this phylum are protostomes or deuterostomes. Animals in this phylum are protostomes. Phylum nematoda, another worm, but specifically the phylum has nematodes. Hookworms and pinworms are examples of nematodes. Ask a person what a nematode is and they'll likely be puzzled, but these animals have huge ecological impacts. Nematodes can infest crops. They can be parasites of humans, of your pets. Actually, they can be parasites of almost all animals. Not all nematodes are parasites, though. They can actually be very beneficial to soil ecology and they're popular for study in labs. Most nematodes are very small. They can be microscopic, and they can live in aquatic environments, both saltwater and freshwater, as well as terrestrial environments. Symmetry is bilateral. They do have cephalization. And while they have something called a pseudocelum, they don't have a true coelom. They're protostomes, and unlike most in the previous phylum, phylum nematoda have both a mouth and an anus, so they have two gut openings. And FYI, the remaining phyla that we will cover after this generally will as well. Phylum mollusca. The mollusk. Think of tiny micro mollusk to giant squid. Snails, clams, octopuses. These are all mollusk. Many mollusk are aquatic, saltwater, or freshwater. Some are terrestrial. Many, but not all, mollusks have a shell that is secreted by a structure called the mantle. Many mollusks have a radula, which is kind of like a tongue-like structure and used to scrape or rasp food. Mollusks have a muscular foot to help them move. Symmetry is bilateral. They do have cephalization, and they do have a coelom. Also, they're protostomes. Phylum Annelida. Lots of worms. Earthworms, leeches, tube worms. Animals in Annelida can be aquatic, freshwater or saltwater, and they can be terrestrial. Most in this phylum are segmented, which means they have repeating body parts. They often also have external rings, and most but not all have setae, little hair-like structures that can help them move or swim or even anchor themselves. Symmetry is bilateral. They do have cephalization, and they do have a coelom. Also, they're protostomes. Phylum Arthropoda. Oh, here we are with the ant and other insects and spiders, which are not insects, and crustaceans, all examples of arthropoda. Arthropods can live in aquatic environments, freshwater and saltwater, and they can be terrestrial. And as a bonus, many fly. These animals have jointed appendages and segmented bodies. Their exoskeleton is tough and protective, but it still lets them move around easily. For some, the metamorphosis or the change they go through from larva to adult, can let them have the benefit of different resources. Symmetry is bilateral. They do have cephalization, endocelum, and their protostomes. Phylum echinodermata, sea stars, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, these are examples of echinoderms. Animals in this phylum are aquatic and live in specifically saltwater. Most larvae of echinoderms have bilateral symmetry, but as adults, most have radial symmetry. Many echinoderms have the ability to regenerate portions of their structure. For example, many sea stars can regenerate a lost arm. Some can even reproduce asexually from that lost part. What about cephalization? Okay, so the phyla we've mentioned so far that did have cephalization. Recall that means animals in those phyla generally have a head, an anterior region, with a brain or ganglia that function similar to a brain. But animals in echinodermata do not have a brain. Most do not have ganglia either. Echinoderms do not have cephalization. However, they do have a coelom. They're deuterostomes. Interesting is the other phyla that we've covered to this point have only had protostomes. 
Okay, we're nearly there to the last phylum on our list, but something to point out. Up to this point, all these phyla have contained animals that are invertebrates, meaning all the animals we've discussed so far do not have a vertebral column or spine. It might surprise you that if you were to consider all animal species, it's estimated that approximately 97% of all animal species are invertebrates. Funny, that's often not what we picture when we think of an animal. But vertebrate animals will be in this last phylum, chordata. Chordata contains the vertebrate animals like fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. A reminder that humans are examples of mammals. And chordata even includes a few invertebrates too, like this lancelet, because animals in chordata are actually defined as having a notochord. The notochord is a flexible rod-like structure that runs along the back dorsal area. And for vertebrates, it's there during embryonic development, but it often gets replaced by vertebrae, although often remnants of it can still be found. Some chordates like that lancelet keep the notochord throughout their life. Other characteristics you'll find in chordates that will be present during a stage of embryonic development or beyond include having a dorsal nerve cord, pharyngeal slits or pouches, postanal tail, and a thyroid gland or endostyle gland in some of the invertebrate chordates. Animals in this phylum can be found in aquatic environments, saltwater or freshwater, as well as terrestrial environments. Some can fly. Like arthropoda and annelida, chordates are segmented. Animals in chordata have bilateral symmetry, they do have cephalization and a coelom, and like echinodermata, they're deuterostomes. Whew, so that's a brief overview of nine animal phyla with some major characteristics vocab. Are there more animal phyla that we didn't include? Oh yes. Are there more characteristics of each of these phyla to learn? For sure. And so, from the sponge of periphera to a puma in chordata, we hope you will keep exploring. Well, that's it for the Amoeba Sisters, and we remind you to stay curious.